Hello everyone, Tommy's Reptiles here. In this video, I'll be telling you everything that I've learned over the past couple years about how to take care of frilled dragons. First, let's talk about the lighting and heating requirements of frilled dragons. If kept inside, they will need a heat and UVB bulb. I normally let them shed on their own, but I'm gonna help out with this little piece right here. Before I go more in depth on heating and lighting, I just wanna say that when I initially started researching frilled dragons, there's a lot of information and it's all different. So some people would say that their basking temp should be 90 degrees, others would say 115 degrees. So in cases like that, I use an average of both those temperatures. And the average of that is 102.5 degrees. So I would start off with that and if I felt like it was too hot, then I would dial it down a little bit. And if I felt like it was too cold, I would raise it up a little bit. And then I would see how my frill dragons reacting to that. With frill dragons, it's very important to give them a, a set basking spot where they can go and heat up as hot as they want. But they also need to escape and go to a more ambient temperature. And I think the ambient temperatures that I read were between 70 and 80 degrees. So again, I tried to average that. And then I just played it by ear. And if I felt like it was too cold or too hot, I turned it up or down a little bit depending. Since I live in Florida, I'm lucky enough to be able to bring my frilled dragons outside at least once a week to soak up some natural sunlight. I positioned this stick directly in some sunlight, and of course, when I started filming, clouds covered the sun. So I waited quite some time for the sun to pop back out so my frilled dragon can soak up some fresh UV rays. Another method that I use for heating and lighting is to look up the area of the world that frilled dragons come from. I check out the temperature, I check out the terrain, and then I try to mimic that to the best of my ability. And I recommend using this method for all aspects of reptile keeping. You look up where the reptile comes from and you try to mimic their natural habitat the best you can. Doing this will increase the chances of them staying healthy. It'll make them more comfortable and also give them a better quality of life. I just put my first frilled dragon moth back. So now it's time to let Squishy soak up some sun. Their scientific name is Chlamydosaurus. Kenji. I'm not entirely sure I pronounced that right, but it's the best I got. From what I've found, Chlamydosaurus means cloaked or mantled, and Kenji means king. In Australia, where they're mainly found, they're called frilled neck lizards. They are also called frilled lizards, and in the United States, they're called frilled dragons. Besides being native to Australia, they've also ranged up to Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. Frilled dragons are bipedal, meaning that they can run on two legs. This helps them evade predators like birds very quickly. Now it's time to put Squishy back and take out my new female rattle. She is almost old enough to breed, so hopefully in the future, she will start making more frilled dragons. Females should be at least two years old, if not older, to start breeding. If you breed them at a younger age, it could risk their health. After reading multiple sources, I figured out that when they lay eggs, they lay anywhere from seven to 20 eggs. The incubation temperature for the eggs should range from the low to mid 80s, like 83 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. It can take anywhere from 90 up to like 110 days for the eggs to hatch once they're laid. And the eggs require at least 90% relative humidity. And once they hatch, you could actually keep all the baby frillies together, no problem. But once they get bigger, you should never keep two male frill dragons together because they could become territorial and they could hurt each other. You can keep multiple females together and a male and multiple females together. This is my two foot cube enclosure. So it's two feet high, two feet deep and two feet wide. It currently houses one of my juvenile frill dragons, but shortly she will be upgraded to one of these enclosures down here and have plenty more room. I'll open the enclosure and give you a closer look at what it looks like inside. She's definitely outgrown it, but you can see I made vertical climbing branches which are perfect. I need to get some of those screen protectors for the UVB and the heat light over here. But so far I've had no issues. I would like to move the sticks away from those lights, but it's okay so far. It's very important for frill dragons to have vertical climbing branches because in the wild, that's normally what they climb on. I'm gonna bring her outside, but I'm gonna feed her inside because she gets very stressed out out there and I don't wanna put any more stress on her than I have to. I just use the mealworm container as a dish, throw it in there and then I put the mealworms on top and she'll normally hop down and eat them. And if she doesn't after a while, I just pick it up and then lift it up to her and she can enjoy a nice little snack. And this brings me on to my next topic, which is the frilled dragon diet. Frilled dragons are mainly insectivorous, but that doesn't mean that they can't have fruits and veggies as a treat or some real meat as a protein boost. I mostly feed my frilled dragons crickets, grasshoppers, mealworms, superworms, waxworms, and hornworms. I dust their food with calcium D3 and vitamin mix at least twice a week. This helps ensure that they get the nutrients that they absolutely need. I give my larger adult frill dragons a frozen thawed mouse at least once a month to give them a real protein boost. And once every two to three months, I trick them into eating a vegetable 
or I give them a little piece of fruit as a treat. From my experience with frail dragons, I've never had an issue with one of them not wanting to eat. They always seem to be hungry. Every so often, they'll go a day without accepting food, and that's okay with me as long as they eat the next day. If they look too skinny, I just feed them a little bit more, and if they look too overweight, I feed them a little bit less, and that's just how I do it. From what I've noticed, my frail dragons only drink water when it's mimicking rain, so I spray them two to three times a day and make sure they get a full drink. Now it's time for Petal, my juvenile Australian frail dragon, to go outside and get some sunlight. She is by far my feistiest and craziest frail dragon, so I just like to get her outside, put her on the branch, and leave her alone. She has at least two years before I would even consider breeding her because she's too small so far. Frill dragons are from the order Squamata, the suborder Saria, and the family Agamidae. And I believe them to be Australia's largest Agamid lizard. One of the most interesting aspects about this lizard is their frill. It is mainly used to deter, scare off, and intimidate predators. When a frill dragon displays their frill, they're saying, look at me, I'm dangerous, stay away. And if for some reason a predator is not afraid of that, they turn around and run away on two legs like you saw earlier. And also, as you just saw, they can whip, scratch, and bite. I always feel bad taking this frill dragon outside specifically because she always gets so stressed, she's always on high alert, but I know it's very beneficial for her to get the natural sunlight. UVB bulbs are great and all, but they'll never be as good as the real thing. So it's really good if you have the opportunity to bring your lizard outside to get the real thing. All right, let's get her in her cage before she attacks us again so we can go grab the little tiny baby frilly. Which brings me to my next topic, which is handling. From what I noticed, frill dragons don't enjoy being handled, but they can learn to tolerate it. I recommend getting a frill dragon as young as possible so you can have more time to get it used to you and used to handling. With any reptile, I think it's important to try your best to not grab them and conceal them. I like to let them climb on my hand and stay on my hand. Once in a while, you'll have to grab them if they try to run away, but I think it's good to just let them climb on your fingers and get comfortable. I actually try to handle each one of my reptiles at least once a day, so they're used to me going in their enclosure, used to interacting with me, and used to me handling them. If you don't take the time to work with your reptiles and try to handle them a little bit and get them used to you, then all they're gonna be is freaked out when they see you and they're not gonna want you to touch them at all. I've heard people say that frilled dragons are only for intermediate or very experienced keepers, but if you take the time, do the research, set up the enclosure, that's nonsense. You can take care of any reptile you want as long as you put in the hard work. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and got something out of it. Thank you for watching Tommy's Reptiles.